this is our fourth lesson and uh, in this lesson we're going to talk about uh, discrete filters basically how we can uh, use the frequency domain representation to manipulate the signals and uh, the tool we're going to use are called filters and we're going to talk about uh, how to what kind of uh, what kind of filters we, we would prefer and how do we, do we actually construct those filters uh, through uh, Fourier analysis okay. Um, so here's a short recap about the main points from lesson two, right? So one of the things that, one of the major theme of this particular uh, course is that we're trying to sort of investigate the possibility of representing any kind of signal. Here xn is some kind of arbitrary signal. We want to investigate the possibility of representing any signal as superpositions or linear superpositions of some basis signals. And in lesson two, the basis signal that we used were shifted. Well, those shifted delta impulses, the impulse signals, basically. Those shifted and scaled impulses, right? If you actually represent an arbitrary signal as this kind of a linear superposition of impulse signals, right? Impulse signal as basis signals. You can investigate what's gonna be the output signal for a linear time invariant system or LTI and the result of that investigation led to the definition of what we call the convolution operation right it's a convolution right it's basically a convolution of the input signal xn with what we call the impulse response of the linear time invariant system which is represent represented as h here right so the impulse response is basically just the the output signal of the linear time invariant system if the input is a delta impulse with zero shift, shift with, without any shift, right? With no shift, a delta impulse. That's it. And the output signal is basically just the, the same linear superposition, right? It's actually the same linear superposition. Just replacing the delta impulse with the impulse response here, right? And the, and 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 this superposition, linear superposition, actually gives us the output signal of the linear time invariant system. And we looked at uh, how we can actually uh, compute this convolution uh, using MATLAB. Right? We have a function called CONV underscore m dot m. This function that can compute the convolution for us. And then in lesson three, the main theme for lesson three is that we investigate the possibility of representing any kind of signal xn as linear superpositions of a different kinds of basis signals and this kind of signal this kind of basis signal is complex exponentials this kind of thing that's our basis signal in lesson 3 basically right so we're switching in lesson 3 we're actually switching to a different kinds of basis signal right complex exponentials right and it has a frequency here that's a big omega this integral is basically summation, right? If you have looked through the videos of lesson three, you know why it's an integral instead of summation. Right? If uh, if it's a it's a if you wanna if it, if xn is a periodic signal, you can represent it as not an integral but a summation over discrete frequencies. But if xn is aperiodic, it's a, it's a periodic signal. Then you have to write it as a integral, right? But integral is kind of similar to a summation, so so you can still treat it as a linear superposition of this kind of a basis signal, right? And the the weighting coefficients, the weights in front of those basis signals, is given by the Fourier transform coefficients, right? And you can compute it. You can compute it by doing the forward Fourier transform or discrete Fourier transform. That's this formula. Basically, you can just compute it as a summation of xn times e to the minus j omega n, right? For the synthesis equation, it's e to the positive j omega n, right? And one of the consequences for representing a arbitrary signal as linear superpositions of complex exponentials is this kind of convolution formula, right? The Fourier transform of two signals convolving each other equals two. The Fourier transform of the first signal, big X1, multiply the Fourier transform of the second signal, right? And the reason that we have this particular property is because this complex exponential, this particular basis function, 
this basis signal that we are using to represent any kind of input signal is an eigenfunction of a linear time invariant system, basically. It's an eigenfunction. Eigenfunction means what? If you use this thing, if you use this signal as the input, the output is still going to be this particular signal, but scaled with a number, right? Could be a complex number, but it's still just a number. And that scaling, that scaling coefficient, that number, is actually the Fourier series. It is actually the Fourier transform coefficient for the impulse response function, h. Right. So 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 that's your input, the Fourier transform of the input, the Fourier transform of the input. The notation has been changed a little bit. Here it's big omega. Here it's a small omega. E to the g, e and j is like a constant, so it doesn't really matter. But but big X is sort of the Fourier transform of the input signal small x. Right. And then big H is actually that scaling vector, the eigenvalue, the eigenvalue corresponding to this particular eigenvector, right? No, it's actually this particular uh, this this particular eigenvector, basically, right? If you replace big omega with small omega, right? so so in the Fourier domain, convolution actually becomes just a multiplication. If you have an input, if you have a Fourier transform of the input, if you have a Fourier transform of the impulse response, response multiplying them together, you get the Fourier transform of the output. And then if you do a inverse discrete Fourier transform, you get the time domain representation of the output signal, right? And this very nice property of converting converting convolution to 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 to, to multiplication in the frequency domain is a basic consequence. It's basically just a consequence of 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 this pro of the property of the, of this particular basis function, it's a it's a it's an eigenvector of a linear time invariant system. It's a consequence of that, basically, right? Of course, you can re replace replace e to the j omega with just a complex number that's called a z, right? You still get the same kind of a property, right? If you do a z transform in the z transform domain, you still have this kind of property, right? Convolution becomes a multiplication. And 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 that's that's basically probably one of the most important results from lesson three, right? In lesson three, we talked about lots of results. For example, Fourier transform have the Fourier transform has many useful properties, right? The sampling theorem, right? And uh, some other things, right? But in lesson four, in lesson four, we're gonna use this representation to manipulate our signal, right? Since we can actually represent xn as linear superpositions of these kind of basis signals, right? We can then select what kind of a, what kind of modes we want to use, what kind of modes we want to reject, right? Because it's a linear superposition of many many different modes, many many uh, uh, of this kind of complex exponential. So we can select, so we can select from this summation. Which term we want to include and which term we want to exclude, right? And this process of selecting those modes that we want and rejecting those modes that we don't want is called filtering. And filtering is actually a quite a, quite 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 big topic, right? It's um, it's not just the in signal processing, right? It involves also differential equations and difference equations, that kind of thing. Right? And uh, but in in this lesson, we're going to talk about the basics. Right? We won't sort of deal with very deep uh, applications of filtering operations. We're just going to talk about uh, how how to define filters and how to actually what kind of features of the filters are desirable, that kind of thing. Right? So. So so let's let's start with probably the simplest simplest uh, uh, filter, a low pass filter, and it's called ideal frequency selective filter or IFF, ideal frequency selective filter. The reason it's called ideal is because it has this kind of behavior. So if frequency is within a band within a omega c uh, band defined by omega c then it's exactly one. And outside of this band, so here's the typo, let me let me correct it. So the reason that this is called an 
ideal frequency selective filter is that it passes it passes all the modes without any modification all the modes that's within this with with frequencies lying between this uh, this range right and it's going to reject all the frequency modes that's outside of this frequency range without any kind of modification it's just a either pass or no pass right and 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 the the, the frequency content that that's passed is called this 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 frequency range that goes from minus omega c to positive omega c is called pass band right and then everything else that's outside of this range is called stop band it's either pass or stop right for those frequencies that's being passed it's not going to modify those uh, frequency content at all because the amplitude is exactly one right and there's no phase to it the phase is actually zero right and for those f frequency content that's being rejected that's the amplitude is just exactly zero so all those frequency content is just a zero out right you have no sort of uh, modifications to, to those frequency content right and the reason it's called a low pass is because the pass band this pass band is actually centered around zero right it's centered around a zero so it's actually a low pass so if it if it's not centered at around zero but around some higher frequency that's called a high high pass right and and then you also have a, have a, have a band pass right we're going to look at those ideal high pass and ideal low pass filters in a little bit right so so that's an ideal low pass frequency selective field this is kind of a representation in the frequency domain basically it's a it's basically a box car window in the frequency domain it's a, just a, that's the frequency axis and this is sort of the a box car right so so now let's look at let's look at uh, uh, high pass and band pass filters right it's a uh, one thing from lesson three that we can actually think of is that Big H omega, the Fourier transform of an aperiodic signal, actually is periodic, and it has a period of two pi. Right. We looked at the, the Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform of a time domain box car, right, in lesson three. That was one of the examples that we studied in lesson three, and its Fourier transform. Is some kind of sync function, that kind of oscillatory function, with a with a with a with a fundamental period of two pi in the frequency domain, right? So 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 one of the conclusions we have reached in lesson three was that for an aperiodic signal in time domain, its Fourier transform is actually periodic. The discrete Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform is actually periodic in the frequency domain, and it has fundamental period of two pi. So, so, so because the, because the frequency domain big H omega is periodic, so how do you actually define high pass and band pass, right? How pa high pass and band pass? You define it this way. So, if the box is centered around zero, or any integer times of two pi, so so here it's a it's a it's centered around zero, right? It's a box around around zero. And then there is another box that's centered around a positive two pi, and then there is another box centered around a minus two pi, right? If if those boxes are actually centered around integer times of two pi, then it's actually a f low pass field, right? Because it's actually selecting the, the the frequency content that's closer to zero, because two pi is basically repetition of zero frequency content for for for, for DFT. Right, minus two pi is another repetition of zero, right, of the zero frequency content. So, so if you're actually passing the frequency content centered around the zero or two pi or minus two pi or any integer times of two pi, then it's actually a low pass, right? Then what's actually a high pass, right? What's going to be a high pass filter? Right. 
A high pass filter is a box that's centered around pi or minus pi. See, so if if zero is actually the low, if zero if you look at just the if you, if you just look at one fundamental period of the DFT of some kind of a priori signal, then the fundamental period within the middle goes from minus pi to positive pi, right? A box centered around a zero is a low pass. Then where is actually the high pass, high, high, high frequency content? It's, a, it's, a, it's the content that's surrounding pi or minus pi, right? Because the minus pi is basically the same as pi. It's a, it's a because the fundamental period is like two pi. So if you have a box that's centered around either minus pi or positive pi, or any multiple times, so so if you go to a minus three pi, positive three pi, that kind of thing, skip by like two pi, right? It's periodic, periodic. There's another box that's at three pi. There's another box here at minus three pi, and then that's gonna be the high pass field. And then what's going to be a band pass, right? What's going to be band pass? A band pass field is just a box that's sort of not centered on zero, not centered on positive or minus pi. It's centered at some points that's between zero and pi. Right. And then that's a band pass. So so for for DFT, for discrete Fourier transforms, your low pass, high pass, and band pass filters are basically uh, defined it like that, right? And if you actually pay attention to this kind of a diagram, you're gonna see connections between low pass, high pass, and band pass filters, right? If it's the same box car, then for low pass it's just centered around zero. For 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 high pass it's just centered around a pi, right? You're basically just the shifting a box car. From zero frequency to like a pi frequency, right? You're just moving, shifting the box from zero to pi, basically, in order to actually tr convert from a low pass filter to a high pass filter. To a band pass filter, if you want to convert a low pass filter to a band pass filter, you don't shift pi, you shift you shift the box to a, to a value that's between zero and pi, right? So in order to get a band pass filter from a low pass filter, all you have to do is to shift. In order to get a high pass filter from low pass filter, all you have to do is to do a shift in the frequency domain, right? So if we understand how to construct low pass filters, we can obtain band pass and high pass filters by just doing this kind of shifting in the frequency domain. And a shifting in the frequency domain is basically modulation, multiplying a complex exponential in the time domain. It's one of the four transform properties that we have studied in lesson three, right? We studied how to, what's actually the shifting in the time domain, right? Shifting the time domain is equivalent to multiplying a complex exponential in the frequency domain with the phase of that complex exponential given by the amount of the shift, right? The same is true for, for shifting in frequency domain. If you shift some, if you shift something in the frequency domain, it's equivalent to multiplying something, to multiply a complex exponential in the time domain, actually. That's called a modulation. That's called a modulation operator, right? So you can basically obtain a high pass or band pass filter by by modulating the time domain representation of a low pass filter, right? And that's that's um, that's a consequence of the Fourier transform properties, right? And uh, and 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 this this kind of representation are all in the all in the uh, or in the frequency domain, right? But but now let's look at the time domain representations of an ideal low pass frequency selective filter, right? So so here's the here's the here's the representation time domain representation of a low pass box car for, for this kind of thing. For this kind of thing. Right. But how do we actually get this representation, right? So in order to get this particular representation, all you have to do is to bring this uh, boxcar representation, one zero, this representation, uh, into uh, this formula, right, and evaluate the integral, right. 
if it's a periodic signal, if you want to actually a periodic signal, then it's basically a summation, right? Instead of uh, an integral. Right? And uh, this particular integral or summation can be evaluated analytically, and the result is a, f a special function that's called a sync function. It's a sync function. And you can Google about what's actually the representation of this sync function. It's basically a sine, a sine function divided by something, right? And uh, it's called a sync function. It's a special function. And this sync, sync function looks like that. It looks like this kind of thing, right? It has a peak. It has a peak at zero, n equal to zero, right? And then it has ripples, ripples on both sides. It's symmetric, basically, right? And then the first crossing, the first zero crossing, the first zero crossing here, right? And the location of this first zero crossing is a pi divided by big omega c, basically, right? The zero crossing. So, so, so the width. The width of the width the, the width of the center lobe, this center lobe, the width of the center lobe is basically controlled by this parameter. Right? And so so you can imagine if omega c is large, right? Omega c if omega c is large, which means what? Which means this box car is very wide. If this box car is very wide, then pi divided by big omega c is small, which means what? In time domain, it's very narrow. It's a very narrow function, right? But if omega c is very small, which means what? Which means if it's it's narrow, it's narrowing the frequency domain. If it's narrowing the frequency domain, then pi divided by big omega c, omega c is small now, so pi divided by omega c is big, so it's going to be very wide in time domain, right? Again, it's a kind of inverse relationship of the width, right? Wide, a wide a wide box car, a wide window in frequency domain corresponding to a narrow sync function in time domain. And a very narrow box car, a nar very narrow filter in the frequency domain corresponding to a very wide sync function in time domain. Right. That's that's what this function uh, looks like, right? But 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 let's let's try to construct this function um, for a for a, for a particular omega c, right? So if you want to know about the MATLAB sync function, you can sort of just type help sync. Then it's gonna display how how you can actually use the sync function. It's the definition of the sync function, right? It's basically sine pi times x divided by pi times x. So so if you call sync x, then it's the function that you're actually getting is sine, right? Pi times x divided by pi times x. So let's define how omega c equals to pi over four, and then let's try to define a horizontal axis that goes from like a minus 50 to positive 50, and then all we have to do is to type up this particular formula, right? Sine. So h l p equals h equals two. So omega c divided by pi times sinc omega c times n divided by pi, right? And then we can just uh, make a plot of it. And uh, that's going to be our time domain representation of an ideal frequency selective filter, right? So it's IFF, that's a time domain representation. In frequency domain, it's a box car, right? In frequency domain, it's a box car. In time domain, this box car looks like that. And the amplitude here is supposed to be like a, a omega c divided by pi. Omega c divided by pi, it's one fourth, it's 0 0.5, it's supposed to be 0 0.5, I think. Uh, 0 0.25, I mean, 0 0.25, not 0 0.5. 0 0.25. Point two five, and then the zero crossing, the first zero crossing here, it's supposed to be pi divided by omega c. It's supposed to be four, I think, right? For this particular example, I, I'm using, it's supposed to be four. Right. So, so that's called an ideal frequency selective field, right? But in practice, this kind of ideal frequency selective filter are uh, not particularly useful, basically. It's not particularly useful. The reason is that sometimes the frequency content that you want, for example, this triangle, and the frequency that you want to reject this particular shape here, do not have sort of clear separation between them. They actually have some sort of overlap, right? If you want to keep the triangle intact, you may want to use a filter that's not a boxcar, 
but with some kind of tapering, some kind of tapering in the frequency domain. So, so the triangle is kept intact. And uh, even though you have included some of the noise they wanted to reject, but by, by doing this kind of tapering off, you can reject all the mo the most part of the noise, but but still keep the triangle intact, the signal that you want intact. So, so, so that might be a better uh, filter, right, uh, for practical purposes. Okay. And the second reason that IFF IFF is not particularly desirable is because, for instance, it has some drawbacks, right? This kind of filter is non-causal, for example, right? It's non-causal because it has this is a time domain representation of a box called IFF, right? So it's non-causal. It's infinite, actually. It's infinite and non-causal. It's keeps it keeps oscillating forever, right? Non-causal means that it has non-zero amplitude before zero. So if you want to implement this kind of filter in real time, for example, right, as the signal actually comes in, you apply this filter in real time, then this kind of filter is not really practical, right? And uh, and it's not causal. It's not causal, and it's, it's sort of infinite. Um, and in terms of the implementation, this kind of a filter may take lots of resources to actually implement, either as a digital filter or as an analog filter. It's um, it's it's actually quite expensive to actually implement this kind of a ideal frequency selective filters. Right. So uh, so so in practice, you may want to use a non-ideal a non-ideal frequency selective filter, or NFF, right? What what this kind of NFF actually looks like, right? This is actually this is actually uh, half of the filter, half of the low pass filter, right? So it only goes from like zero to pi, right? And you also have minus pi to zero on this side, but it's going to be symmetric, so so it's not drawn here. For 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 non-ideal for non-ideal uh, frequency selective filter, you don't really have a very clear cutoff. You either pass or stop, right? You have a transition between the pass band and the stop band, right? You have a transition, and this is called the transition band, right? So omega p is called the pass passband edge, omega p is called a passband edge, and omega s is called the stopband edge. And the frequency content that's between omega p and omega s is called the transition band. And within this transition band, the amplitude of the filter is not 0 and not 1. It's some value that's between 0 and 1, basically. right? So, so it's not like you are rejecting all the frequency content within this band completely. You're accepting some of it, but the amplitudes are like changed. It's it's diminished, right? So as you're getting closer to omega s, the suppression is larger. Right? As you're getting close to omega p, the suppression is smaller. So you have this kind of transition. And for the pass band, it's not exactly one, right? It's not flat. It's not a flat one. It actually oscillates. Oscillates, oscillates within a range that goes from like a one subtract delta p to one plus delta p. It's oscillating within this range. See, right? It's a, it's a, it's not flat, and this kind of oscillation is called a pass band ripple. It's called a pass band ripple. It's just like a ripple because it oscillates. And then in the stop band, it's not exactly zero either. In the pass band, it's not exactly one, and in the stop band, it's not exactly zero, but it also oscillates. It also oscillates, and this oscillation is called stop band ripple, right? And also has a representation called delta s. You see, that's sort of the maximum amplitude of this stop band ripple. These are some of the some of the terminology that people use to describe those NFF or non-ideal non-ideal frequency selective filters. Right. Pass band ripple, stop band ripple, pass band edge, stop band edge, transition band, pass band, stop band. Right. And depending upon how you design the, the, the filter, the different kind of amount, different kind of ripples may have different kinds of amplitudes. Right. Yeah. You have to come up with a trade-off 
that's kind of ideal for your situation, for your particular application, basically. Right. So, so that's a that's the basic shape of a low pass in FF. Right. And what I was telling you is that you can construct high pass and band pass filters by just uh, shifting a low pass filter. Right. By shifting a low pass filter, basically modulation, doing modulations in the time domain. So now let's look at some examples of this kind of a, uh, NFF, this kind of non-ideal frequency selective filters. These are sort of the, the target, the, the main focus of this lesson. We're going to deal with non-ideal frequency selective filters. Right? And uh, you, have, you have two basic different types. You have two basic different types of this kind of NFF. One is called a non-recursive, and you can imagine what's the other. The other is called a recursive. And what's actually the distinction between non-recursive and recursive, right? You, you're gonna you're gonna understand what what's actually the distinction after we talk about uh, uh, some examples. So here is one example of a non-recursive discrete filter, right? So y n that's the output equals two x n subtract one plus x n plus x n plus one divided by three. If you if you sort of Look carefully about this particular formula. It's actually a three-point moving average, right? It's a, it's an average, but it's a moving average because of n. n can start from like a one, right? When n can start from one and then moving on to 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 every other points. So every every point of y is actually a three-point average of x surrounding this n, right? Surrounding this n. It's a three-point average. The reason that it's called a non-recursive is because yn does not depend upon previous yn, right? It does not depend upon yn subtract one. It does not depend upon yn subtract two, right? You see no y on the right-hand side of this equation. You only see x, right? You don't see y. If you see y, then it's a recursive. But if you don't see y on the right-hand side, then it's a non-recursive filter. Right. But now, let's let's try to determine what's actually the 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 expression for this particular filter in the frequency domain. Right. Let's let's try to determine it. So if you want to determine the filter in the frequency domain, let's do a Fourier transform. Let's do a Fourier transform of both x and y. Basically, the left hand side and also right hand side. If you do a Fourier transform of y n on the left hand side, you get a big y as a function of omega, right? If you get a, do a Fourier transform of this thing, if you do a Fourier transform of this x, then what you're actually getting is a shifted Fourier transform of x, right? It's a Fourier transform of a shifted x. And the amount of the shift is one, right? So, so this particular this the Fourier transform of this particular term equals to what? Equals to this term. So, so big X is the Fourier transform of small X, right? And then because you have a shift, then you have this term. So e to the positive one j omega. This is a, the shifting property of Fourier transform, right? If you actually shift the signal in the time domain, in the frequency domain, you have to multiply with the complex exponential with the with the phase of the complex exponential given by the amount of shift, right? That's one of the results from lesson three, basically, right? So x n, if you Fourier transform x n, then you get big X, right? And if you Fourier transform x n plus one, you get this term. Right, even minus j, minus one j omega. You have a, you have an, uh, another complex uh, exponential here, right? And then you can do some simplifications now. You can do some simplifications, and the result is that it equals to x big x e to the j omega. That's the Fourier transform of x. Multiply this term, right? How I got this cosine, right? If you add this term with this term, right? Big X can be sort of extracted, right? Taken out. 
and then this e to the j omega subtract uh, plus e to the minus j omega equals to two times cosine omega basically right the imaginary part is going to be, be, be cancelled out right so in frequency domain in frequency domain the output actually equals to the Fourier transform of the input multiply with some other function and this function actually has this particular form if we define big H omega equals to this thing then the output is basically the Fourier transform of the output is basically just the, the Fourier transform of the input times big H omega right multiplication in frequency domain multiplication in frequency domain corresponding to what to convolution in time domain so basically, you can think of this particular filter as a linear time invariant system, and it has a impulse response or Fourier transform of the impulse response given by this particular formula. Right? Because the output in the Fourier domain, the output equals to the Fourier transform of the input times the Fourier transform of the impulse response, and the expression for the impulse response is given here, right? So you can denote that, denote this impulse response for transform of the impulse response as big H omega here, right? So what's going to be our filter here? Our filter is what? Our filter has a frequency domain representation that looks like that, right? So 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 let's let's try to make a plot of it, right? Try to make a plot it, plot it. So omega, that's O goes from like minus two times pi to maybe maybe not two pi, maybe it's four pi. Let's, let's look at the longer periods, right? Four four times pi. That's omega. Then h big h equals to one plus two times cosine O, right? And the whole expression divided by three. So we need to sort of plot both the phase and the amplitude, basically. So if you plot the amplitude, you can sort of take the ABS, right, absolute value of big H. Right? Uh, that's the sort of the amplitude. The maximum is like a one, and then the min uh, the minimum is like zero, right? That's the amplitude. Right? And then you have these kind of ripples. You have these kind of ripples, and the amplitude of this kind of ripple is probably one third. I think it's a one third. And uh, it's actually a low pass filter, right? It's actually a low pass filter. If you if you go back to compare with our definitions of high pass and low pass filters, right? So so here it's centered at zero, right? The pass band is actually centered at zero, right? It's an, it's not ideal. It's not ideal. So 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 you don't really have a flat part, right? And then the low frequency part. No, the, the 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 stop band, the stop band or the 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 the, the frequency content that it's actually trying to suppress is a, is a, is close to pi, right? Even though it also has ripples, right? But the stop band is around pi or minus pi, right? And then it's actually periodic, so 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 this this peak this center lobe is a center at pi, zero, right? And then this is actually two pi. This is actually too far. This is minus two pi. Right. right. It's actually corresponding to our representation of a low pass or diagram of low pass. It's a schematic drawing of a low pass field. Right. So, so, so that's basically that's basically um, that's basically a, a low pass field. A three point average in time. Is actually a low pass field, right? And it's a non recursive discrete field, low pass field. Right? Of course, we can also plot the phase, look at the phase, right? So this is the angle, but if I, uh, this is the absolute value, but if I look at the angle, right? You can sort of see what's actually the angle, right? It has uh, no phase, it has zero phase basically, right? Zero phase in the pass band. So, so, so in practice, it's actually a quite a useful filter.
right? That's the phase angle, right? and then it has a, a, a angle of pi, angle of pi close to uh, positive and minus pi. So basically, basically it's a low pass filter. It's three point average. Of course, we can sort of um, generalize our derivation a little bit further. If we actually represent e to the j omega with a complex number that's called z, right? Then it's one third e to the j omega replaced with z. Then this is z minus one. This is x z, right? And then this is what? This is z. This is z to the uh, first power, so so that's z, right? And then you can just uh, uh, do some algebra, right? Take out x z because it's common vector, and then all you have to do is to collect all the terms. So z minus one, one z, right? Z minus one, one z, right? And then this uh, this what we call the transfer function, right? This transfer function can then be represented as what y z divided by x z. Right, y z divided by x z, and then this particular formula can be written in terms of a summation. n goes from minus one to positive one, and then one third z minus one to the nth power. Right, and this kind of representation is related to uh, z transform basically. Right, it's related to z transform. Later on, we are gonna sort of look at how we can actually underst understand this particular formula. Right, how we use this kind of particular formula. So it's a three-point average. So so a three-point average is basically low-pass filter, and we looked at the amplitude and phase of that low-pass filter. But now let's look at the, another expression. That's this thing. Right? It's x n subtract x n minus one divided by two. So it is a it is basically a differencing equation, right? It's a differencing equation. So this this point is subtract its previous point and then divide by two. It's actually a numerical approximation of a derivative, right? It's a derivative approximation. So 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 let's see what this what this particular formula actually represents. So three point average represents a low pass filter. This particular formula actually represents a high pass filter, basically, right? Again, we can actually do the Fourier transform here. Y is converted to big Y. Right, for a transform, the Fourier domain. Small x converts to big X, and then small x in subtract one, one is transformed to big X times e to the minus one j omega. Right, because of this shifting. Right. So all we have to do here now is to collect a big X. Right, one half big X, one subtract e to the minus j omega. And this particular formula can be manipulated even further, right? You can extract a e to the minus j omega divided by 2 out of this square bracket. And then the term that's inside of the square bracket becomes e to the positive j omega divided by 2, subtract e to the minus j omega, by, j omega divided by 2. And then the result is 2 times sine omega divided by 2, right? And then with a j, 2 and 2 cancels out. 2j sine omega divided by 2, right? 2 and 2 cancels out, you have a j left out, right? So now the transfer function can be written like this, right? Again, let's uh, let's make a plot of it. h equals 2, 1i times exp, right? Minus 1i times o divided by 2, right? And then dot multiply, dot multiply psi, o divided by 2. Right, that's our h. Again, if you want to look at, if we want to look at the amplitude, we can sort of plot abs big h, right. Now let's look at what this field actually is, right. Let's look at this field now. Let's look at this field. What I claim is that it's actually a high pass field, right. The reason that I say it's a high pass filter is again, let's compare it with our definition of a high pass filter, right? A high pass filter should look like something like that. Pass band is surrounding pi and minus pi, right? And uh, in the middle, surrounding zero, 
your amplitude should be sort of small or stop it it should be the stop it right so around a zero it's indeed a small amplitude right and uh, and uh, and uh, the amplitude at exactly zero is actually zero basically right so so it's uh, basically in the stop end and then pi is actually at this particular location this is minus pi this is positive pi so these two pair spans these two pair spans is actually centered around minus pi and pi that's that's the pair spans pass bands. So in principle it is actually a high pass field, right? It's a high pass field. So so this kind of difference in equation corresponding to corresponds to a high pass field and uh, this particular filter has a non-zero phase now it's non non-zero phase right and then uh, uh, has this kind of amplitude response right so now let's get back to look at low pass filters right let's get back to look at low pass filters so so this filter is basically a three-point average but in principle we don't really have to limit ourselves to just the three points right we can do any points, right? We can use any number of points to do the average. So here's a, actually a generalization of a three-point averaging formula. So k goes from minus big N to positive big M. And then you're basically averaging through this many points. So it's big, big N plus big N plus one, this many points, right? So that's why you divide by here. So you're taking the average. So here it's the summation. You sum, sum over this particular range and then divide by the total number of uh, 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 points in your summation range, right? And then what's going to be the Fourier transform of this particular signal, right? Of this particular output. Again, you can you can go through the same derivation here by using the Fourier shifting property, right? All you have to do is to get the Fourier transform of this particular shifted x, right? It's a shifted x, see. And and then and then. You can you can what you the result is that the transfer function is going to look like this kind of expression. Some k goes from minus big N to positive big M, and then it's e to the minus j omega k. Right, that's the amount of shift. Basically, that's the complex exponential multiplied to the to the Fourier transform of small x. The Fourier transform big X basically, right? Big X. That's the that's the complex exponential multiplied to each term. To each of the terms within the summation, right? And then this this summation can be evaluated analytically by using geometric series, and the result is gonna gonna look like something like that. It's it's gonna look like this thing, right? And we can sort of take a look at the shape of this particular filter. You can imagine it's gonna be a low pass filter, right? It's gonna be a low pass filter. And uh, but what's actually the shape of it, right? But let's 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 do some experiments. Let's do some experiments. Um, this time we're gonna just look at uh, zero to pi. Let's just look at the zero to pi because it's a low pass field. Uh, looking at the zero to pi is sort of enough. Let's go from O goes from like zero to 0 0.01 to pi, right? That's our frequency range. And then all we have to do is to uh, compute this formula. Compute this formula. Um, Let's 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 pick some values. Pick some values for m and n, right? Um, so so suppose m big m equals to 16. Big n equals to 16, right? And then big h equals to one divided by m plus m plus one. So big n plus big m is basically 32. 32 plus one, 33, right? So m plus m plus 1 equals to 33. And then multiply with 1i times o times big N, subtract big M, divided by 2. Right. So big N equals to big M. So big N subtract to big M is going to be 0. So this convex exponential doesn't really uh, have any effect. Dot multiply right, and sign. Uh, 
all times big M plus big N plus 1 divided by 2 divide dot divide sign or divide by 2 So if we want to look at the amplitude of H, it's just to use O, maybe SH. So that's going to be our low pass filter. Axis tight. Right, that's our that's our low pass filter. Lots of ripples, right? Lots of. It's a non-ideal low pass filter. It's a non-ideal low pass filter, so it has lots of ripples in the stop band, right? And in the pass band, it's um, it's not exactly zero, but it is nevertheless a low pass filter, right? And uh, in practice, sometimes people plot in terms of the log, right? Use log to 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 represent the gain of the filter, right? So if you plot the log. 10 of this amplitude. Right. If you do the log 10 and then multiply 20 and multiply this number with by, by a factor of 20. Right. So if you if you if you plot it like that, you basically log 10 of the absolute value. The absolute value is called the gain, the gain of the field multiplied by 20. Then the vertical axis has a unit called dB. dB. So y label for this particular plot is basically dB. And that's that's a that's a common convention to use to represent or plot the gain of a filter. Right. So so that's a, that's a, that's a, that's one of the uh, examples for m equals to n equals to um, 16 right but suppose we increase the number of points used for averaging let's let's change m equals to 32 for example right and then n equals to also 32 let's recompute h right let's recompute h so so this time m plus n plus 1 equals to uh, 65 now, right? Now l let's hold on to the old figure and then make another plot. Still in terms of dB, but let's uh, use a different color. Let's uh, say use R, right? use red. Right. Now you can sort of see it's um, how how different are they, right? For this uh, 65 point average, you can sort of see the stop end. The stop end, the ripples for the stop end has a smaller amplitudes than the 32 point average, right? right. So, so, so it's a better suppression of high frequency content, basically, right? It's a better suppression of high frequency content, right. just by comparing the the gain of these two types of filters. So, so that's um, that's the sort of moving average of uh, uh, more points, basically, right? This is formula. Uh, this is a low pass filter, but with uh, more than three points, or, or an arbitrary number of points that you want to use, right? 16 and 32, that kind of thing. Right. But this formula can be generalized even further, right? For now, this average, this kind of average, has equal weights for each of the points. Every point x in this summation gets the same weight. It's one divided by big M plus big M plus one, right? But we can actually use different weights for different points, right? So you can generalize it even further to this kind of formula, right? So k still goes from like big N minus big N to positive big M, the same same kind of range, right? But each of the points that's being averaged has a different weight, and it's given by BK. Right. And uh, 
you can actually try to find the optimal BK for a particular purpose. For example, if we want to sort of make the pass bend as flat as possible, but and also simultaneously attenuating all the signal in the uh, high frequency range, right? You can pick BK so that you can achieve that kind of purpose, right? So this is this is actually goes from like a minus uh, pi over four to positive pi over four, and this is for a 16 point average with equal weights, right? This is the spectrum. I'm I'm basically just replotting it, replotting this big H with with big M equals to 16, big N equals to also equal to 16, 16 point average, and it's uh, it's gain the gain of the filter in frequency domain, right? The gain of the filter. But now let's try to use a different weight for different points, and the weights that we're gonna it's still gonna be N equals to M equals to 16, but the weights B K is gonna be dependent upon K. So when k equals to, is smaller than 32, we take this formula. It's a sync function with some kind of uh, values, right? Some some values uh, as uh, as its argument depends upon k basically, right? And then for k larger than for for absolute value of k larger than 32, b k equal to zero, right? So it's still a 32 point average, right? It's still a 32 point average. But each of the each of the points gets a different weight, gets a different different weight based based on this particular formula, this sync function formula. Right, the weights that's multiplied in front of the x. Right, and then you can uh, you can again you can compute you can compute um, it's for transform the Fourier transform of the of the of the of the filter of the corresponding filter. Right, by by using a similar technique here, pretty much the same basically. But now you have the complexity; you have to deal with this particular sync function also as a function of k, basically, right? So so you have a, yeah, not just the complex exponential that's coming out of this shifting, right? But also you have to multiply with a sync function that's that's a k, and then you can evaluate the 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 Fourier transform. But the impulse response of that filter has already been derived before by other people. The impulse response looks like this kind of figure. Uh, looks like this kind of a function. Right. Let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's compute it. Right. Let's compute it. So so small h equals two. Small h equals to two divided by thirty. Um, first of all, we need to define n. Right. Let's give it a big n. Let's use a big n. N goes from like a. Um, let's let's use minus five hundred to positive five hundred. Right. And then let's define this impulse response h equals to two divided by thirty-three times sync two n divided by thirty-three. Right. So the size of n, size of h is like a, a one thousand and one, I think. Right. One thousand and one. So that's the size of h. Right. So now let's make a plot. Let's make a plot of this impulse response. Uh, let's just do a stem. Stem n h. Right. Oh, I forgot. I forgot one thing. So so this this formula is just for n equals to smaller than or equal to 32, and uh, for larger than 32 it's zero, right? So I need to modify it. So let's let's pick an idx equal to find abs n larger than 32. Right, and then h i d x equals to zero. Right, so this way I zero out everything that's larger than 32. So if I do another stem n h, that's the impulse response basically. Right, if I want to zoom in, right, it's gonna look like that. So basically, if you actually apply this particular filter, this particular filter on an impulse as the input signal. Then that's going to be the output, right? That's called the impulse response, right? If you use a impulse as input to this particular filter, the response, the output is going to look like that, right? But now let's compute the Fourier transform of this impulse response, right? And then we can get a frequency domain representation, right? So, so big H is going to be the Fourier transform of small H, but the 
the MATLAB FFT, I'm here just here I'm just using MATLAB FFT, but the output of the MATLAB FFT is gonna place the negative frequency part at the end of the spectrum, at the end of the output vector. So if I wanna shift it, shift the negative frequency part to the beginning of the output vector, I can use another MATLAB function called FFT shift, right? So FFT shift is gonna shift the negative frequency part to the beginning of the output vector, big H, right? That's that's uh, that's big H. Right. So now let's make a plot of this big H, and then we're going to compare it with the the gain of this equal weight, equal weight moving average with also 32 points, right? Also 32 points moving average. Let's look at uh, the gain, for, compare the gain for these two particular uh, different functions, right? And then let's just plot O. Two times, uh, 20 times log 10, maybe it's a big H, but this time let's use red, right? I, I still need to hold on to the old figure, and then plot this in, right? Again, the, the vertical axis is in dB now, right? And the frequency axis, the horizontal axis is frequency in terms of pi, basically. Here, the range of the axis goes from like a, a minus pi over 4 to pi over 4, I think. That's the horizontal range of the frequency. And you can sort of see the pass band is uh, flatter and wider, right? It's a low pass filter, but the pass band centered around zero is wider. And is uh, the ripple is actually smaller, right? It's flatter compared with the equal weight of moving 32.8 moving average. And the, the, the most important advantage is that now the stop band or, or the Transition band is like a way lower. See, so the frequency content that you don't want is being suppressed even more compared with the equal weight 16 point average, right? It's it's a it's a it's a low pass filter that enhances or keeps the pass band more or less intact and suppresses the stop band energies even more, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a better filter, basically, right? It's actually a better filter. It's a better low-pass filter, according to some kind of normal standards, right? What you want, what you want. You want the pass band to be intact and the uh, stop band to be uh, as, uh, as suppressed as possible, right? So by using a different weight, you can actu actually achieve a better filter. See, you can actually get a better filter just by choosing the weights more carefully.